right? Amen. So the part of the chapter specifically that I want to focus on is right there in verse number 1, where the Bible reads, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And the, the title of my sermon this morning is just Fellowship in Light of the Bible. Fellowship in Light of the Bible. So I'm going to be preaching about the importance of fellowship and why fellowship is a necessity for the Christian life. Now the word fellowship specifically is not used in this passage, but the concept is definitely found in this passage. So if you look again there in Psalms chapter 133, verse number 1, <clears throat> David the psalmist writes, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. So that's brothers and sisters in Christ. For brethren to dwell together in unity. So what the word fellowship actually means if you break the word down. So fellow is just someone that you have something in common with. Like this morning, you know, you are my fellow church members. People that attend a different church, they're not my fellow church member. You know, you are also, you know, fellow Americans with me as well. The ship there at the end of the word just is is just a word that it's it's showing the state or the condition. It's because the word is a noun. Now, I'm going to go ahead real quick and have you turn to uh let me have you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 14. <clears throat> but like I said, I'm going to be preaching about the importance of fellowship and why it's a necessity for the Christian life. Obviously, we have many different things that we need in our Christian life to live a prosperous Christian life, to live a, you know, a, a blessed Christian life. Some of those things are prayer. You know, uh, one, or one of those things is prayer. Another one of those things is Bible reading, right? And I strongly believe that another part of that is fellowship. Now that goes hand in hand with attending church. Church, and if you were to ask a person, what are the three things that you need to live a blessed Christian life? I would guarantee, you know, whatever denomination, it wouldn't matter who you spoke with. Most people would tell you, you know, you should have a prayer life. You should read your Bible. And then most people would also say you should attend church. And fellowship and church is where you get that fellowship. Now, not everyone that comes to church, though, does engage in fellowship. And I think it's good when people come in the door to greet one another, to speak to one another after church is out, you know, to speak to one another, you know, to greet each other by name, like the Bible says. But it's also good. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to think that I'm only focusing on church. It's also good to have fellowship outside of church. So we're going to have you turn 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 is going to give us just a more of a definition of what fellowship is according to the Bible. We saw, though, the importance that the Bible puts on fellowship. You know, and there in <coughs> Psalms chapter number 32, the great emphasis. If you would have noticed, you know, that first statement was an exclamation. He said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he likened it right after that under the moment when Aaron was anointed as the high priest, which is a very historical moment. That was a very important moment, a significant moment in history and in the Bible specifically. And then right after that, <coughs> he likened it unto a blessing. Fellowship is indeed a blessing, and it is something very important in your Christian life. And let me say this too. You can read your Bible all the time. You can even come to church. You can have a prayer life. But if you have zero fellowship in your Christian life, you will fail in your Christian life. I, yes. I sincerely believe that. And I'll tell you why. Because we're all humans. And it doesn't matter if you're the most uppity person that exists upon this planet. If you just feel like you're always happy. Everyone goes through hard times in life and everyone has, you know, times of trouble and tribulation. And if you have no fellowship during that time, you will give up and you will fail in your Christian life. Fellowship is that important. It's something, it is like I said in the beginning of the sermon, a necessity to the Christian life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, <coughs> verse number 14. We actually see the word fellowship used in this verse. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And then here we're going to see that he makes the same statement a few times so we can get a very, you know, a very broad idea of what the word fellowship means. <clears throat> he says, And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth? with an infidel. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
For ye are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we see there are a lot of different words used interchangeably or used synonymously with, with the word fellowship. One of them being communion. And then right after that he says, what concord. So like a connection or a link. It's like I said earlier. You know, the word fellow is someone that you have something in common with. That's what God's saying here. What does righteousness have in common with unrighteousness? That's what he's saying. He says what he's saying what what does light have in common with darkness? What does Christ have in common with Belial? You know, what does a believer have in common with an infidel, with an unbeliever? They have nothing. You know, this right here is where we should start when it talks about having fellowship. Now, there's nothing wrong with having acquaintance out in the world. There's nothing wrong with that. We go to work, obviously God <coughs> Jesus Christ said that he prayed, you know, that we would that he would that we would be kept from the world, but not that we would be completely taken out of the world. That's you know, that's definitely true. There's nothing wrong with going to work. There's nothing wrong with having acquaintance in, in work, out in the out in the world. But you know, our true fellowship and our best friends that we have should be church members, should be other believers, should be those that, you know, want to live a righteous life, should be those that are believers, not infidel. And here's the thing, too. You can have the best friend in the world, you know, that's, that's someone out, out, in the wor out in the world, you can have the best friend, and it's someone, if it's someone that is, you know, a worldly friend, that's not a saved, that's not a, you know, a, a Christian person, when you go through that time of trouble, they will not be able to help you. If they're not a saved Christian, they have no hope in this world. If they're not a believer, when you go through, you know, your downtime, when you go through, <coughs> you know, a state of depression, have, you know, if, if you will, you know, you will not find the fellowship and the help that you need amongst your friends and amongst your acquaintance out in the world. You have to have that fellowship from, you know, those that... That, that, you're in, that you have something in common with in Christ. From brethren, like David said. From brothers and sisters in Christ. Go to, let me have you turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. Now, what I'm going to do in this sermon is I'm going to give you three reasons. <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to give you three reasons why you must have fellowship with brethren. Why you must have fellowship with brethren. Now, <clears throat> Like I said, you know, we should this should be our our starting point is that our fellowship should be with people at church. Our fellowship should be with Christian friends. And here's the thing, you know, <coughs> if you're able to still be really close friends with people that you were friends with, you know, before you got saved, before you got in church, if you're able to be really close friends with people that are unsaved in your job, people that are you're just not believers who don't believe the Bible, then you're probably not living the right life. If you're able to be best friends with them, like I said before, our close friends, our best friends should be at church. And like the Bible says in Amos, in the Old Testament, very similar to what we see here, you know, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? The only way that you can have that much in common with that person you know, is that you're living the same lifestyle that they're, that they're living. Is that you're being carnally minded or that you're fleshly minded. That's the only way that you can even still be, you know, such good friends with that person. And that's, that, actually, that verse pops into my mind every time I read here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 where it says, And what agreement at the temple of God with idols. Like it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? So that can be a first step in your Christian life as well when you understand, hey, I need good Christian fellowship. When we have these events, you know, everybody should strive to try to come to these events. That's an opportunity to have fellowship with brethren. You know, outside of, outside of uh, you know, church, just meeting here and greeting one another here. Now, <coughs> I had you turn to Hebrews chapter number 24. My first point, though, here I'll read to you from Psalms chapter number 133. My first point of why we have to have, you know, why it's necessary to have fellowship in our, uh, in our Christian life, we actually already read it in Psalms chapter number 133, and that's because if you don't have fellowship, you know, in your Christian life, number one, the number one thing that you're missing out on is you're missing out on a blessing. I'll read the passage to you one more time. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And then it says this, As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, 
For there the Lord commanded the blessing. So he says it's as that. And he's saying it, it's as the do, right? For there the Lord commanded a blessing. And he says even life forevermore. And life is always coupled with a blessing in the Bible. Always, over and over again. So right here when he's talking about how sweet, how good, and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, he likens it to, like I said earlier, the significant moment, you know, the, 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 the very important moment in history when Aaron was anointed. Then he also likens it to the great blessing that God gave, you know, with, with the dew was at Hermon. You know, Number one, the number one reason why it's necessary or why it's needful to have fellowship in your Christian life and, it, and what you're missing out on is you're missing out on a blessing. Now look at Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. <clears throat> the Bible reads, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And he says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And this is definitely talking about church, but notice what's going on at church as well. Well, look what it says in verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So notice it's it's one another. So yes, we come to church. We receive edification from the preaching. We receive edification from you know the pastor, from the preacher. But we also receive edification from one another. We also receive you know motivation. We also receive exhortation. Look at verse number twenty-five. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So over and over again, <coughs> notice it keeps saying one another. Just like in verse number twenty-four, it says, "Consider one another." to provoke unto love and to good works. So like I said, the general overall reason, the whole entire sermon, my, all three of my points can be summed up with the reason why we need fellowship is because we're human. That's the, that is the overall reason. That's the general reason. Number one, you know, we're missing out on a blessing. We're missing out on the blessing, the happiness that comes with fellowship. You know, the happiness that comes with spending time with Christian, you know, brothers in Christ. You know, number two, we're missing out on the motivation, on the encouragement, on the exhortation. It, even if, <coughs> even if you... You know, come to church, but you don't spend time outside outside of church with brothers and sisters in Christ. Or if you come to church, you come in and you just leave right away. You are missing out on exhortation. You are missing out on being provoked in your Christian life to do greater things for God. You can, you can be exhorted and you can be doing better things for God. You can be provoked, like it says right here, and exhorted. And you could, you could push your Christian life to the next level if you had better fellowship. If you had great fellowship, turn to Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 13. We can encourage one another. We can also hold one another ac ac accountable. <coughs> Even if you're a self-motivated type of person, which I personally feel like I'm that type of person. You know, before I moved to Faithful Word, I went to the same kind of church that everybody went to. I went to an IFB, you know, King James Only Church, but all of those churches are pretty much dead. They're all almost identical. All of them, you know, you might find some a little better than others, but they're all almost identical. And I was still able to read my Bible regularly. You know, I had a position at the church while I was running a couple ministries. You know, I preached at the church pretty often, you know, behind the pulpit maybe once every two months or something. And, you know, by the time I moved to Faith Forward, I, I had read, had my Bible read nine times exactly. And I personally, I didn't have any, I had zero Zero fellowship. Like, I had zero Christian friends that were my age. Zero. No one. You know, it, another thing that you know about these churches is that they have no young people. And it was the same way for my wife. She had no friends. Like, her best friends were literally, like, 65, 70 years old. Her favorite time throughout the week was to go to the ladies' club. And literally, besides her, the youngest, the youngest woman there was probably, like, 63, 62, maybe in their 50s, possibly. Like, we had zero fellowship. Now, I personally, like I said, I feel like I'm a pretty self-motivated person. Most, I, don't, I don't think that most people are that way. I think you can get that way from maybe sports, you know, when you're growing up, you can play a lot of sports and stuff like that. And, but I, I personally feel like I'm a self-motivating person. And even if you feel like that, even if I felt like, you know, I, I, can, <coughs> I can just continue down this road, you know, and I'll keep reading my Bible, that will not happen. 
even if you are a self-motivated type of person and you don't have fellowship, you will hit a bump in the road. And if you don't have other people to help you, you don't have other people to encourage you and to provoke you, you'll fail in your Christian life. Fellowship is that important. Look at Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 13. The Bible reads, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So notice again the ex exhortation, almost a very similar statement to what we just read in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 24 and 25. He says, but exhort one another daily. So you know what that tells me? That you shouldn't only be having fellowship on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. You should be having fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. You should be having communion with them daily. Because he says, exhort one another daily. You should be having fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ all throughout the week. You should be speaking and exhorting one another and provoking one another to do greater things. And notice what's going to happen here if you don't do that daily. If you don't exhort one another daily, it says, lest. That would be the result of not exhorting one another. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So Paul is giving that, <coughs> that warning to exhort one another daily. <coughs> if you don't do that, it's very possible that you'll be hard hardened <coughs> through the deceitfulness of sin. That's another reason why you need fellowship, because you'll fall into sin if you don't. Turn to Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 16. Right now we're looking at a lot of practical reasons of why we need fellowship in our Christian life. Why fellowship is necessary to live a, a, a prosperous and blessed Christian life. <clears throat> Look at Colossians chapter number 3, uh, verse number 16. This is another practical way on, on the subject of how we can encourage one another or provoke one another. It says in verse number 16, <clears throat> Excuse me. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So notice what he says. Teaching and admonishing. And there we see those two words together again. One another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to to the Lord. Now I'll tell you what I believe that this verse means because notice it says that we're admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you're singing, when, we're, when you're sitting there, you know, in your in your seats and we're singing, you know, during the portion of the services where we're singing the hymns. Obviously, we're singing to God. But if you're singing quiet, that's not only affecting you. That doesn't only show you know, a manifestation of your of your spiritual life in connection with God. But you know what it also does? It also doesn't admonish those around you. It doesn't encourage those around you. You are helping those around you when you sing loudly. When you sing loudly and you sing and it's obvious that you're zealous about the singing, you're zealous about the songs, that encourages and admonishes those that are around you. That's how you teach one another. We all sing together. All the examples all throughout the Bible are always of people singing in a congregation. Every time. Always throughout the Bible. So when we see this passage here talking about admonishing one another, right? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, it's very safe to assume that we're all singing at the same time. You know, I'm not going to just walk up to Brandon after the services and just sing him a song. You know, it's talking about the congregational singing. And that's why it's important to sing out and to sing loud. So even when we're here <coughs> and we're at church, because like I said, some of this overlaps. You know, the fellowship and being at church and everything, a lot of it overlaps because this is a time where we have great fellowship while we're at church. Before the services, during the services, after the services. And we can encourage one another. We can provoke one another. You could help someone else's Christian life if you were to just sing out a little bit more. You could help other people, you know, enjoy singing the songs more. You know, some people are a little bit more shy than other people. Some people, you know, aren't as good of a singer as other people. And that may cause them not to sing out as much. But if they hear everybody else just singing loud, don't you think that that person will be a lot more likely to also sing out and also to sing loud? And that just shows that, hey, we're helping that person's Christian life. You know, we're helping that person move to the next level. Go ahead and turn it to the next passage is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. But that's just a practical way, <coughs> you know, with fellowship of how we can encourage one another. 
<coughs> Excuse me. So like I said, point number one of why fellowship is necessary for the Christian life to live a blessed Christian life. Number one is because if you don't have fellowship, you'll be missing out on a blessing that David talked about. That the, the happiness and the blessing that comes with fellowship. Point number two is that you'll be missing out on encouragement. And you definitely, with fellowship, would do more in your Christian life than you would without it. Period. That's a fact. And, and I don't care if anyone disagrees with me, that is 100%. Even being a self-motivated person. When I moved to Faithful Word, I did much more for God. And I felt like I did a lot for God there while I was there. And then I moved to Faith Word, and it's a great church, and you have all these people around you that are zealous Christians. All these people that have these big goals, they want to do great things for God. And you know what it does? And it doesn't matter if you're way up here or way down here when you get here. It pushes you to the next level. It pushes yeah. you and wants you to do more for God. It pushes you and it wants you to get closer to God, to read your Bible more, to know your Bible more. When you go around people and you're speaking to them just in their everyday life and they're just constantly making references to the Bible and joking around the Bible, it just shows their Bible knowledge and it makes you want to know the Bible better. You know, when people are, are constantly singing the hymns, you know, it makes you think, man, that person really likes the hymns. That person really loves the hymns. That person really loves God. They like to sing out to God. You know what it does? It encourages you and it provokes you and it motivates you to push your Christian life to the next level. And you would do more for God if you had more fellowship in your life. Yeah. However much fellowship you have, obviously there's times when it needs to be just our family. Obviously there's times when we have to get things done, we have to go to work. You know, but we should daily be having fellowship in some way with other Christians. <clears throat> Obviously, you even have your wife. You know, hopefully you're not unequally yoked together, but if your husband and, and, and wife are both married, they're both saved, there's fellowship right there. You should be having fellowship daily. <coughs> Look at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 11. <coughs> the Bible reads, Wherefore, comfort yourselves to get together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So it says, wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and notice there at the end, and edify one another. And also those same words, one another. We keep seeing that coming up over and over again. One another. Even as also ye do. Saying you already do that. <coughs> and edify again, and that, that, the word edify actually means to build up, to encourage, to help us to do more for God. But my third point actually transitions uh, in, in this verse here, verse number 11. Notice what it says in the very beginning there. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. The third thing that we need, the, the third reason of why it's necessary to have, a, have fellowship in our Christian life is that there are times in our life when we need comfort. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. As I said a few times... <coughs> We're all human, and as humans, <coughs> excuse me, we must have fellowship. We must have fellowship in our Christian lives. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 reads, reads, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, like I, and I mentioned this also, I alluded to this in the beginning of the sermon as well. You can have, you can have you know, someone who you consider to be your greatest friend. You know, and if they're not saved, when you're down in the dumps and when you're not able to get by in life, that person cannot help you. How is a person that has no comfort and no peace, a person that when they die, a person that is without God in this world, without hope and without God in this world, they have no comfort and they have no peace. When they die, they're going to go to hell. How is that person going to give you comfort when you're down? How is that person that has an entire different philosophy on life going to come to you and try to cheer you up in a situation like that? Another thing about my wife, you know, just as another example of, of, of her testimony, when she, you know, she had obviously a lot of friends growing up. You know, she's pretty popular in high school. She was a cheerleader. And she told me after she moved to Faithful Word and we were here for about six months, she told me, you know, this was confidential, but I'm going to tell everybody now. She told me, she said, I never had true friends in my life until I came to Faithful Word. She noticed that when she started talking to people. And she, you know what she realized? All those people of my past, no one of my past really did care about me. You know, they cared about themselves. And that's how people of this world are. If you are going to depend on the people of this world to help you get through in the hard times, 
you will fail in your Christian life. If that's who you're resting upon, if that's where you're going to go to try to seek help and to seek counsel, you will fail in your Christian life. You know, you can only find true comfort and true peace from other believers in hard times. That's why it's necessary to have, you know, fellowship in your Christian life. <clears throat> like, like this verse read, wherefore comfort one another with these words. What type of comfort are we supposed to get? We're supposed to get comfort from the Holy Scriptures. Your worldly, unsaved friend isn't going to open up the Bible and show you, you know, the verses in the Bible that are going to give you comfort. You know, your worldly, unsaved friend doesn't know the Bible. They're not going to be able to comfort you with these words, like Paul said. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And this is just, you know, we can just apply this to our lives as self-knowledge. When someone comes to us and it's a friend that's, that's down, that's having trouble, you know, don't give them your own advice. You know what you should do? You should think of a scripture to try to help them. Amen. The true comfort is going to be found through the Holy Ghost. It's going to be found through the words, you know, that God speaks. That's where you're going to find true comfort. <coughs> so look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. We'll start reading there. <coughs> And uh, let's start in verse number 2. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and then watch the next statement, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And now watch what it says. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, when, <clears throat> when it says God there, it's referring specifically to the Holy Spirit. You remember in the book of John, Jesus said when he was talking about the Holy Ghost that he was going to send the comforter to them. So us as saved believers, you know, we have the comforter of the Holy Ghost. And notice the process here. Notice the order <coughs> of events. It says in verse, in verse number 3 at the end there, And the God of all comfort who comforted up, comforteth us in all our tribulation. So he's saying that God comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in, <coughs> excuse me, any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And this is a, this is a huge reason, like I said, of why we need fellowship. So coming to church all the time, you know, spending time at church, we all have different things going on in our lives. And we're all human. And I may this week have a bad week. I may this week be you know, down, may be depressed, may have something going on in my life, may have you know, something with my family, whatever it may be. I may have something going on in my life that has me down, or has me sad, or maybe trouble or tribulation like Paul says. And I need to be comforted this week. Right? So I would have you know, a fellowship. I would have a brother in Christ like this says here. You know, comfort me when I'm in trouble, when I'm in tribulation, right? But then later on, that same person, because we're all human, none of us are different. That same person is also <coughs> going to go through some trouble, going to go through some tribulation, right? And we're not always walking in the Spirit. We're not always walking in the comfort. And oftentimes, you know, the person, obviously, that's not going through the trouble, the person that's not going through the tribulation it's easier for them to walk in the Spirit. It's easier for them to walk in the Comforter, to walk in peace, right? And then they're able to go and they're able to help that other brother in Christ. They're able to you know, open up the Scriptures and, and, and to give him comfort and to give that person peace. But then sometimes, the, the, you know, later on, the, you know, the roles will reverse. And then you'll have to go to that person or that person will have to come to you. Notice that, it, that the comfort is given from the Holy Spirit you know, to, the, to the believer there, to Paul. And it says that, that that happens, that comfort and that peace is given to Paul for the purpose of him, him to be able to go and comfort someone else. Now we'll see this actually in the book of 2 Corinthians. I think it's verse, we'll go to chapter 2 first. Go, just flip over in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse, uh, verse number 7. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him. So the him there is referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter number 5, where the young man that had committed fornication was kicked out of the church. And the man, the Bible tells you right here, repented of that. You know, he repented of the fornication that was, he was in. And he came back to the church, and, and now Paul is telling him, 
telling the people at the church that they, they should comfort him. <clears throat> so it says, verse number 7, So that contrary wise, ye ought rather forgive him, and it says, and comfort him, lest perhaps... Now watch what the result of not receiving comfort as a Christian... Not receiving fellowship as a Christian, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Notice that. If you don't receive comfort, do you know what a possibility is? That you would be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. And don't try to be this big tough guy and say that that would never happen to me. Yeah. That's stupidity. Look at, the, look at the great men of God. Look at Job. Look at Elijah. Are you a greater man than Elijah? Are you a greater man than Job? Paul says in this same book in chapter number 1, he says that he wished he would have died. You know, he says that he was going through such trouble and such depression and such hard time that he wished in himself that he would die. So don't have this just attitude like, man, I'm never, I'm never, you know, sad. I never go through trouble and tribulation. I don't need comfort. Everyone needs comfort. Everyone needs peace. Everyone needs, you know, everyone goes through hard times in their life. Life is not easy. And if you don't have Christian fellowship, you know the time when you'll fail is when you go through the hard times. Obviously, it's easy to make it through the easy times. I mean, that's just simple, right? When you go through the hard times, if you don't have fellowship, that's when you'll fail. So right now, yeah, you might be going through an easy time. You might think, <coughs> I'm fine without fellowship. I don't need fellowship. Yeah, right now you don't. But then when, when the, the, the sorrow comes and the trouble comes, the tribulation comes, then that's when you'll be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. That's when you would have trouble in your life and you would need that fellowship. Go to, uh, <coughs> go to uh, chapter number 7 in the book of 2 Corinthians. I'll read you from Philippians chapter number 2. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, then he says, any, if any comfort of love, now watch, watch this again. If any fellowship of the Spirit. So notice the comfort of love is the fellowship of the Spirit. And that's what we all have in common, right? That's the fellowship. That's where the fellow comes from, right? It's because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're fellow Christians. We all have the Spirit, right? That's where we receive the comfort. He says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. And he says this. Fulfill, me, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So notice comfort being brought up, and then immediately fellowship is brought up. And then right after that, he talks about unity, like we saw in, in Psalms 133.1. He's talking about unity, right? How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He talks about them being like-minded, of one accord, of one mind. That's all very important to have that fellowship. That's where you receive the comfort. So you're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 13. And we're also going to see this played out one more time. This is actually a pattern throughout the book of 2 Corinthians of comforting one, comforting one another. It's kind of a subtle pattern. But watch this right here. This is actually, that process that we saw before is actually played out here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Look at verse number 13. He says, Therefore we were comforted, in your comfort. Watch how he explains it. Yea, and exceedingly the more joy <coughs> we, joyed we for the joy of Titus. Now watch this. Because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Now if you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And it was in, does anybody remember what verse that was exactly? Oh yeah, it was verse number 4. So he said, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Right? By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. Then we actually see that played out here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. In verse number 13, Paul says that he was comforted by Titus, who was actually comforted by the Corinthians. So notice that, that Paul says that when Titus went to them, that his spirit was refreshed and he, see, he received comfort. And this was at a time when Paul says that he had the sentence of death in himself, that he wanted to die. And then just through the comfort that, that you know, the Corinthians gave to Titus, Titus you know, carried that comfort with him and that peace with him. And when he came back, he was able to give that comfort unto, you know, uh, unto Paul. When Paul needed it the most. 
When Paul, you know, Titus may not have even been down. Titus may not have even had been in, you know, a, tr a troublous time or tribulation at that time. But Paul did. So when we see other brothers and sisters in Christ going through rough times, going through hard times, we should be like Paul. We should reach out to those brothers and sisters in Christ and try to give them comfort. And like I said, you know what, you know, application-wise, you know what you should use? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You should open up the Bible and give them comfort. You should open up the Bible and give them peace, right? Well, you know, and, and actually, 1 Thessalonians 4, where that comes from, that's actually <coughs> a passage about, you know, not mourning as those which have no, that have no hope. You know, having sorrow like those that have no hope. Because we have comfort. We know one day when we die that we're going to go to heaven. And when, you know, you know, in the flesh, when a, you know, when a relative dies, I mean, we know that it's going to be a while before we see them if they are saved, right? But you can at least go to that person and comfort that person. You can at least go to them and show them the Scriptures, remind them of the Scriptures of the resurrection and the promises that Jesus gave, right? And you can open up the Bible and you can give comfort you know, to other brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> so turn to Proverbs chapter number 27 and we'll end there. Proverbs chapter number 27. So remember the points. Number one, the three reasons why fellowship is needed is number one, because you get a blessing from fellowship. You're missing out on a blessing if you don't have it. Number two, reason why fellowship is necessary for the Christian life is because we exhort one another. <coughs> and number three is that we comfort one another. Is that we can give comfort to one another. <coughs> so Proverbs chapter number 27, verse number 17 the Bible says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So notice it says, Iron sharpeneth iron. And that's just a scientific fact. When, they want to, you want, when you want to sharpen some sort of metal, you just use that same type of metal. Other metals don't work as well. You know, so notice he says, Iron sharpeneth iron. And I'll tell you the reason why. You know, the book of Proverbs is a super deep book. It's full, it's just packed full of so much wisdom. And I'll tell you why I think he used that parallel of iron sharpeneth iron is because they have something in common. They're both iron, right? Fellowship, right? Something in common. Iron sharpeneth iron. And then he says this, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. What's that talking about? What's the countenance mean? It's talking about your face, right? You can look at this in a few different ways. It could be as at, <coughs> at a time when you're sad, you know, and, and your friend comes to you and helps you not to be sad anymore, gives you that comfort. It could also just be at a time you're just, you're just with your friend. Your friend just makes you smile, right? That's the blessing of fellowship. You know, you see the comfort of fellowship, the exhortation of fellowship. But notice they have to have something in common. Iron sharpeneth iron. And it tells you, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So even in the book of Proverbs, a book that's, you know, that's for you know, getting wisdom, we still see fellowship being brought up and the importance of fellowship and why you need fellowship in your Christian life. If you want to be blessed and you want to live a happy Christian life, then have fellowship. You're missing out on happiness. You're missing out on blessings. You know, if you want to, to push your Christian life to the next level, then have fellowship because your Christian friends will exhort you. You know, they'll edify you. They'll build you up. If you want <coughs> comfort, which you need comfort in certain times of your life, then you need to have Christian fellowship. Amen. You know, these three things are very important reasons of why we as Christians need fellowship. And if you don't have fellowship, with Christians, not the world, if you don't have good fellowship with Christians in your Christian life, you will fail in your Christian life. There will be a time when you need fellowship and you don't have it and you will fail in your Christian life. Fellowship is that important. You know, fellowship, brethren dwelling together in unity, like David said, is very, very important. It's very significant. Let's bow our heads and uh, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for just all the instructions, all the things that sometimes may seem obvious, uh, may not be obvious to others, dear Lord. We thank you that you just spell it out so clearly and you make it obvious in your word. We thank you, dear Lord God, for the comfort of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the peace that comes with that, the peace that passeth all understanding. Dear Lord, we thank you, Father, that you have... Uh,
that you have uh, saved us from, from so great a death, dear Lord, that you've given us salvation. We ask you that you would give us that comfort, that you would enable us to comfort others when they're in those times. We ask that you would just bless our fellowship today, dear Lord God, and just be with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.